Riot Games are an infamous games company at this point, and most of their infamy comes from the simple fact that their biggest game ever is League of Legends, a game which itself is infamous. But rather than just hating on Riot purely because of the existence of League of Legends, let's instead hate on them for some of the stuff that they're actually kinda bad at, because the rabbit hole goes a whole lot deeper. When Riot released Valorant in 2020, it became wildly popular pretty much instantly. Riot was making new games, branching out from League of Legends. They'd made Teamfight Tactics in 2019, but that was still baked into the League client. This was the first fully autonomous game that Riot had made, and it was trying to directly compete with Valve's Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Riot made plenty of gameplay changes that made their take on the tactical shooter genre much different than Counter-Strike, but something that had been a big turn-off to Counter-Strike players for decades was cheaters. Counter-Strike is riddled with them, and Riot knew that if they could tackle the cheater problem once and for all, they would have an edge on Valve. Because Valve, if you didn't know, they're pretty terrible. Valve to this day is infamously slow, and cheaters reigned in their games for far, far too long. If Riot could capture the audience of a tactical shooter genre in a cheater-free environment, they would have an enormous edge. So to solve this problem, Riot took the nuclear option. Riot has a piece of software called Riot Vanguard. It is mandatory to use this software if you want to play Valorant. It has very, very deep access to your computer. It runs on a kernel driver, which in layman's terms means it has a very, very high level of access to your entire PC because it is installed at the very core of your operating system. This raised concerns that a third party with the right information and knowledge could fraudulently access Riot Vanguard on a user's computer and essentially use it as a root kit to steal their information. Either that, or a user's information could be unwillingly sent directly to Riot Games via Riot Vanguard. And since Riot has heavy ties to the Chinese conglomerate Tencent, users were extremely worried. They wanted to know why Riot Vanguard had to be so invasive. Riot did launch a bug bounty program to try and prove their own innocence, but this only settled people's nerves on one of the two concerns. This didn't mean Riot couldn't be collecting user info. Riot Vanguard is a very effective anti-cheat. Far, far more effective than Valve's anti-cheat. But many people still refuse to play Valorant solely because of Riot Vanguard. Their privacy concerns have not been addressed well enough to actually try the game for themselves. And to this day, Riot hasn't really justified it. There's no explanation as to why the software needs such high level access to your machine to function. If Riot gives away too much, it can allow cheat software manufacturers to create software that can be detected by Riot Vanguard. So it does make a bit of sense why they keep their cards close to their chest. But for a lot of players, these privacy concerns are just way too much of a turnoff. For the first 10 years of the company's existence, Riot's only game was League of Legends. They only put the S in Riot Games in 2019 when they released Teamfight Tactics. So Riot had a whole 10 years to dedicate solely to League of Legends. 10 years of new champion releases to really figure out what they want their game to actually feel like. You know, how they want the game to play and what strengths and weaknesses they want the roles to have. Stuff like that. But any League of Legends player will tell you all of the same stories. Tales of scary scissor ladies being un killable in the top lane. Stories of an AD carry with a sword and a gun single-handedly killing an entire team. And a lane bully marksman with an already powerful kit that also happens to be able to literally revive teammates for no reason. Every single League player knows that as a general rule, champions released within the last year will be more powerful with more overloaded kits than champions released in the year before that. Oh, I'm a sister lady. I'm a be a... <laughs> I swear to fuck the cat! Everyone knows that this is the way it is. Someone cynical enough might be able to put this down to an angry player base, frustrated at slightly unbalanced new releases. But it doesn't take a genius to see that newer champions have much more in their kits than the older ones. Their kits are overloaded, because League of Legends has a power creep problem. Let's take a look at the newest champion release at the time of writing, Belveth. I will now read out Belveth's passive. In 8, Belveth attacks 36% faster than the medium champion or attack speed. Belveth's ability nine. cast seeks to generate 2 stacks of death on Lavender on death for a resource bar. Which lasts 5 seconds, refreshes on base. While Belveth has stacks, she becomes ghost in 6, 25%. Whenever Belveth scores, it's taken against attack speed. Wait, wait, stop, 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 please. Can we just, can we just talk about a simpler champion for a minute? Like, what about Nasus? Nasus gains lifesteal based on level. What about Morgana? Morgana heals for a percent of damage dealt to champions, large monsters, and large minions. Ezreal. Ezreal gains 10% bonus attack speed when hitting an enemy with a spell, up to 50%.
You get the idea. This trend is very common in League of Legends. Champion designers are trying to push the boat out to keep their new releases exciting. They want the new release to be as cool and exciting to play as possible. They want them to have crazy abilities that push the boundaries of what is possible within League of Legends. But what that means is you get a lot of champions that end up having way too many strengths in their kit. They can basically do everything. And it isn't necessarily caused by a tremendous level of complexity in the kit. Champions like Set or Vex are conceptual very simple. They aren't particularly hard to play, but both of their kits have crowd control, higher burst damage, shields, powerful offensive tools, powerful defensive tools, powerful tower diving capabilities, and the list goes on. They're newer, therefore their kit has just everything going for it. And sure, if you nerf the numbers on their kits enough, they'll be balanced. It's not really a conversation of whether they're overpowered or not. These champions aren't necessarily always overpowered or always in the meta, but what they are is overloaded. Their kits can do so much. So much that other champions just can't do. And it's a problem that Riot has had with their game for a long time. And it's an issue that, to my knowledge, doesn't really exist in the other games that Riot has produced. In 2018, Kotaku released this article, Inside the Culture of Sexism at Riot Games. Kotaku had spoken to 28 Riot employees, some current and some former, and many of them claimed that female employees were discriminated against at the workplace. Women who pitched ideas would be shot down, while men pitching the exact same ideas would be praised. Riot apparently had a sort of bro culture in the workplace, which made this casual sexism extremely common. Riot catered to the stereotypical core gamers, which also meant that they favoured hiring men over women, and women who already worked at the company were less likely to get promoted to more senior roles. But it gets quite a lot worse. Multiple female staff members received explicit photos from male co-workers completely out of the blue. Email threads amongst male employees circulated about what it would be like to sleep with certain female employees, and even lists compiled by senior staff talking about which female employees they would or would not be willing to sleep with. Many Riot employees came out after this article was released saying that it either wasn't true or was being worked on. Allegedly, efforts to be more inclusive at their workplace had begun nine months before the article was published. But many more people came forward after the article was released, telling their stories of sexism at Riot Games. And this article created a huge storm for Riot. There was a lawsuit created by a former employee that alleged discrimination concerning their pay and their position at the company. Riot began internal investigations which caused some senior members to lose their jobs or be retrained. The lawsuit ended with Riot being made to pay $10 million to former female employees over the last five years for their treatment. Although in 2021, this had been renegotiated by a government body to be giving $80 million to the impacted employees instead. Riot did most of this quietly, and you might have noticed that the talk of these allegations and this lawsuit has basically gone away by now. Because fact of the matter is, the consumer doesn't care about the company's words. Riot could apologise all they wanted, but it doesn't necessarily make the consumer like you any more or any less. And Riot knows this, so Riot did the smart thing. They kept their head down, they handled the lawsuit as best as they could, and they released the best content they could possibly muster up while they did so. Shortly after this article was released, Riot released KDA. Hey, To this day, KDA is their most successful piece of music they've ever released. They then made Teamfight Tactics. They made a new Pentakill album. They released Valorant. Because as depressing as it might seem, the consumer doesn't actually care about how much you apologise or how much you strive to be better. The consumer just wants your content to be good. In the court of public opinion, content is king. People are willing to forgive and forget a lot of stuff if the content is worth it. Ties to China and sexual misconduct allegations really don't mean shit to a user if their favourite game continues to be the best game they've ever played. So Riot decided to release banger after banger after banger, and surprisingly enough, it mostly got them out of the mess that they were in. The public opinion of Riot Games has literally never been better. Riot also prevented esports tournament play Players from talking about what was happening in Hong Kong in 2019, and immediately after the backlash began from that, they dropped news about Project A, which became Valorant, and Project L, which will be their new fighting game. Whereas if we take a company like Blizzard, for example, they have had basically the exact same sexual misconduct allegations risen against them too, and they've had similar controversy surrounding Hong Kong in the past as well. But whereas Riot makes banger after banger, Blizzard is constantly dropping the ball and disappointing their fan base, and you'll notice that Blizzard's 
controversies are still brought up many years later, and that's no coincidence. Riot made all of its users forget about any of their wrongdoing. They just quietly settled their lawsuit and improved on their content, and we all just instantly forgot about it. Those clever bastards. Riot Games has a bit of a tutorial problem. Riot likes to make complex games, and that's great, because complex games are usually the ones that still have players 10 years later. They're the games with the high skill ceilings and the endless replayability. But Riot, much like another company I've mentioned in this series, has a really, really big problem explaining to new players what the hell is going on. League of Legends is an extremely complex game, with tons of depth. It has crazy interactions, five different roles, all with different types of champions in them. There's counter matchups and jungling, and over 160 champions, and League's tutorial, the entire thing, is at most 20 minutes long. And I don't just mean like an intro tutorial, where there's a bunch of optional in-depth stuff later on. No, the entire thing is 20 minutes long, and it's also just completely terrible. I have an entire video on how bad League of Legends tutorial is, but just to sum it up here quickly, it doesn't mention the five roles in the game, including the entire jungle role. It doesn't mention itemization for AD, AP, and tank champions and what the differences in their items are. It doesn't mention the ranked ladder. Certain champions don't work how they do in game, like Scion missing his death passive. The bots just randomly go AFK in the middle of a game. It doesn't tell you what an inhibitor is. It doesn't explain the ping system, and it doesn't explain the rune system. And all of that stuff is extremely basic to the way League of Legends functions. It's not like any of that is extremely complicated. But but it's extremely important, and the tutorial doesn't even try and tell a new player any of it. Another issue League of Legends has is Smurfs. To play in ranked, your account needs to be level 30. So if you already have a ranked account, but you want to try and see how high you can climb on the ranked ladder on a fresh account, you have to make a Smurf account. And Smurfs have to level up their own accounts to level 30 manually, meaning that a bunch of very experienced players end up playing in normal games against brand new players, which makes the experience for that new player completely terrible. And this exact same issue also exists in Valorant. The tutorial is very lackluster, telling you only the very very, very basics of the way the game functions. And you only have to win 10 ranked games to get into ranked, so Smurfs rarely ruin it for new players who are brand new in their first unrated games. But being able to get into ranked so soon just means that players go up against Smurfs in their first 10 ranked games instead. And Teamfight Tactics doesn't even have a tutorial. There's literally no explanation of what's going on at all. And it's a problem that Riot seemingly has no intention of fixing. A lot of Riot's games, League of Legends in particular, thrive off of existing players. New players in League of Legends are actually not that common. The game doesn't grow very much. But what the games do have is a very, very massive number of highly dedicated players who play every single day. And they're dedicated enough to make alternate accounts or even spend money on the game. So spending time, effort and money on revamping their tutorial isn't worth it for them from a business standpoint. They would rather keep making money off of their existing players while spending nothing on the new ones. Because the changes the tutorial system for these games would need would be very expensive to create. So they just won't do that. They'll hope a third party YouTube guide is enough to teach a new player the ropes. Or at least keep them around long enough to buy a KDA skin or two before before quitting the game entirely. Oh, and speaking of skins... Every game that is free to download needs microtransactions. For the game to get continued development, the developers need to get money from the project to fund new content. And microtransactions are how free games do this. And quite frankly, Riot's microtransactions are actually pretty good in the grand scheme of things. You know, for every Riot game, there's a thousand Genshin Impact clones on the App Store for your phone. But Riot's microtransactions do have some things wrong with them that prevent them from being completely perfect. Valorant's microtransactions have three main issues. Issue number one is the price point. Their skins are extremely expensive for what they are. They have not only a cost in Valorant points, which is the in-game currency used for most microtransactions, but they also have a cost in Radionite, a currency that's used to upgrade guns VFX and stuff that is also bought with Valorant points. It can cost upwards of $70 to $80 to fully upgrade one single skin. But the second problem has been already alluded to here these in-game currencies. In-game currencies such as these are very insidious, and a lot of players don't really realise it. In-game currencies are used to obscure the value of your currency and the things that you buy with it. Look at this, it costs $5 to buy 475 VP, but double the price at $10 gives you 950 VP plus 50 bonus. So that's double the real money for slightly more than double the fake money. And this trend continues all the way up the store page, meaning that the value of your in-game currency is hard to truly put a concrete number on, which makes it harder for players to see 
just how terrible the store is in terms of value for money. And it also makes it hard to tell how much real money you're actually spending. And Radionite adds another layer to this, having to do a conversion to calculate from dollars to funny Monopoly money, and then to Radionite makes it even harder to tell what's really going on. The final issue here is with the Battle Pass. Battle Passes are generally accepted by most players, because you get a lot of content for a small entry fee. But what a lot of players fail to realise is that Battle Passes are very sneaky, because they try to foster habit and addiction in the player base. Because you don't get the content you paid for if you don't log into the game every single day without fail. And the Battle Pass's content is on a time limit before it goes away. They give you a good deal, but only if you're willing to generate a habit of logging into their game over and over again. And that habit being fostered means that you're another player that's more likely to spend money on skins. League of Legends also has an in-game currency. And it also has overpriced skins. But it doesn't have a Battle Pass, and it only has the one in-game currency that can be purchased with money. But League of Legends loses its battle pass for something that most people would consider far worse. Loot boxes. League of Legends has loot boxes that give you random loot, but the silver lining that both League and Valorant do that is very good for the consumer is that they allow you to just buy what you want directly. Sure, there are loot boxes, but they're way less necessary to get what you want than they are in a lot of other games. Because you can just directly buy the skin that you want from the store instead of having to gamble for it. Teamfight Tactics uses the same currency as League of Legends, Riot Points, and the microtransactions here are purely cosmetic, but it's much harder to just buy what you want. Because Little Legends come in all different colours, but you can only directly buy the basic version of each. If you want one of the fancy colours, you have to gamble for it in a loot box. There's also a Battle Pass, which of course, I don't like. But at least the Battle Pass gives out free loot boxes, even to people who didn't buy the Battle Pass. But it's still unfortunate to see such a reliance on gambling mechanics for their microtransactions here. Now here's the part where I would talk about Legends of Rune Terror, but I never played it. Riot's microtransactions, for the most part, are better than a lot of other companies out there, but for every area they succeed in, there's also an area they fail in. So there's my list of things that I hate about Riot games. If you have anything else that you hate about Riot that you think I missed, please let me know in the comments. And no, being put in loser's queue in League of Legends, that, that doesn't count. Riot Games seem to be much more publicly approved of than the other two companies I've talked about here in this series so far. But that doesn't make them without fault, because clearly Riot is flawed in many ways, just like every games company is. And we shouldn't let them get away with it without criticism. Thanks for watching.